Good morning, um, and welcome to this talk on well, recent advances in system software security. Um, so what does that mean? You can think of this roughly as um, what, what are the new emerging secure, uh, what are a few interesting new emerging security topics for software that you might typically want to write in C? So system software here can be servers if you want to do them in C for performance reasons. It can be operating system code, device drivers. It can be embedded code. Um, it's, it's the kind of code for which you might prefer C today. Um, that's still a significant fraction of the software being written today. On Monday, I had a lecture on, on um, many of the issues that C software faces from a security point of view. And, but there I focused mainly on, let's say, history and state of practice. So, so what, have, what has gone wrong? What kind of attacks have we seen? What kind of efficient defenses have people come up with? And we've seen this attacker defender race. Um, today, I want to focus on, on new things. Um, so one of the reflections you may have um, when you look at the history of uh, software security for C software is, shouldn't we give up on this attacker defender race? Uh, this idea of, okay, there is this kind of attack and then people come up with this, an efficient defense that stops that attack, but then somebody comes up with another attack that bypasses the defense and so forth. Aren't there more fundamental things we can do? Uh, aren't there ways to close off entire classes of vulnerability at vulnerabilities at once? And the answer is, of course, yes, you can do that, but typically there are also many costs associated with that. So you may, for instance, have a performance hit, but you will have other disadvantages too. We'll discuss them. But I think we are at a point after decades of research where there are a number of approaches that are about to become mainstream, that are ready, that are ready for prime time, essentially. And, that, and that's what I'll talk about today. A few of these approaches that I believe are about to be, um, uh, are become a reality instead of just research. So we'll cover three, uh, well, at least two, and maybe three, depending on time. I would rather have, if there are questions or comments, or, I mean, this is a bit forward looking, so you may disagree with some of the things I say. I, I, I might say, okay, this might work, and you may disagree for reasons of your own experience, and I'd be interested to, to have a discussion on that, even during the talk, so feel, feel free to interrupt me at any point. But if that happens, we'll go a bit slower, and maybe we won't cover all topics, that doesn't matter. I'll give you references to, to all of them in the end. Um, uh, an interesting discussion is just as interesting as, 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 a, as a lecture or maybe even more interesting. Yeah, so, so feel free to interrupt whenever uh, you feel like it. But I hope to cover at least the first two. Um, the first is protected module architectures. The basic idea of these is, um, so let's give up on the idea that we can secure the infrastructure. So an operating system on a desktop these days is several 10 million li of lines of code. Uh, an operating system on your phone is 10 to, to 15 million lines of code. Um, there's no way you get that secure. There will always be vulnerabilities in there. Uh, so can we, can we turn things around and, and think about things, what you could call inverse sandboxing? So where you develop your code, your software module, your software application, and you can get some guarantees that it, gets, that it executes as it should without having to trust all the underlying infrastructure, without having to trust the operating system, without having to trust um, maybe even the compiler, uh, that's not something that's ready for prime time. Um, but that's, that's kind of the idea of protected module architecture. So for those of you who have been raised with the idea of syst layer, layered system software and privilege levels in the, in the CPU and so forth, this, is, uh, this seems like a far-fetched idea, but I don't think it is. And actually, uh, the reason why I believe this will become mainstream soon is that the new uh, Intel processor, the new line of Intel processors that was released in the summer, so about, well, three quarters of a year ago now, the Skylake processors have support for this kind of technology under the name Intel Software Guard Extensions, uh, Intel SGX. Um, so that's a, an indication that at least this, uh, there is a, good, a potential for doing this in practice. Okay, so that will be the first um, topic. The second topic is on safe systems programming languages. Um, so we all know, I, I think we all know that from a security point of view, a safe language like Java, C Sharp, Scala, and there are many of them, has many, from a security point of view, many uh, advantages over C, but it also has important disadvantages for systems programming, like things like, well, performance is one, but the fact that you don't have control uh, how things get allocated very well, um, the, the fact that a garbage collector may be interrupting you at some times in a safe language. Uh, these are things that are disadvantages of safe languages. Apparently enough, 
So that C is still the most, well, if you take C and C++ together, they're still by far the most popular language today, even for new developments, okay? So an, another line of research, so more than a decade, probably two decades of research, has been trying to come up with other ways of getting languages safe, not using garbage collection. So try to maintain all the benefits of C, but get rid of the memory unsafety. And again, I think there is a bit of a breakthrough here, uh, and this time it, it's witnessed by the Rust program. Who has heard of Rust? That's excellent, so that's like half of the room. Um, so this is a language developed by Mozilla. Um, it has some advanced features, and we'll zoom in on one of them. Uh, but one of the nice things about it, it it's much more C-like than Java or Scala, um, but it has the memory safety guarantees, give or take, of Java or Scala. Okay, so, so that's the second uh, uh, point I want to zoom into. I w I'll zoom in as, as in particular on the, those aspects of Rust that guarantee its memory safety. And then if there is time, um, I, will look at, at, uh, I, will, I will look at some evolutions in um, what if you can't change C? So what if you have a legacy code base and you're stuck with C? Are there ways in which we can uh, develop countermeasures, compiler-based countermeasures, that are not just defenses against one type of attack, but that give you some kind of hard assurance, maybe even provable guarantees, that a certain class of vulnerabilities cannot be there. Uh, and there are some approaches we'll see, they're by no means perfect, but I think, again, there are two important breakthroughs. So control flow integrity is, again, something that has been researched for over a decade and is now implemented, for instance, in the LLVM. And it's not perfect, but it gives us some provable guarantees. And pointer-based checking, where you actually make C safe through runtime checks, so you also deal with memory safety, but now with, with, a, with a bigger performance cost than you would have with Rust. Um, also, there are indications there that the techniques that have been developed over at least 20 years there in the, in the research field are, are going into practice. Again, one of the indications is that, for example, the, the new Intel processors, the same line here, also has um, support for what is called the Intel Memory Protection Extensions, MPX which is essentially support for this kind of pointer-based checking to make this efficient. And, and with that support, there is hope that we can, with a 20% performance overhead, um, uh, get rid of memory safety vulnerabilities completely um, to some extent. Okay, so that's the plan. Okay, so uh, one good thing is the, these two things are relatively independent and actually these two. So, so, so if you, if I would lose you, that should never happen. If I lose you, ask questions. But should I lose you anyway, uh, you can pick in again on the next topic. So they're relatively independent. They all are related to new trends that people use to, to, to deal with memory safety vulnerabilities. But, but, um, but the connections between the three are small. Okay, so first, protected module uh, architectures. So, so here is the, the kind of thing we want to solve with these architectures. Uh, at least they're one element, of, they're one p element of, the of the complete puzzle to solve this problem. The problem is the following. Suppose you have written a program. Um, so let's focus on C uh, for, for this talk. So suppose you've written a program in C. As soon as it is of a reasonable size, you will, that, that program will consist of multiple modules. So in C, modules are the .c file with the corresponding header file is one module. Uh, and the idea is you do this modular development because then you can compile modules separately and you can reason about modules separately in the sense that this should only depend on the, the, on the interface of this. And if you have a good specification of that interface, if you have good documentation of that interface, you, you don't need to read the code of the module you depend on and so forth. So that, the classic modular development. Um, so suppose you do this and uh, suppose that there is one module in your program that's really security critical for you. It's maybe a crypto module, or maybe it's, it's managing passwords, or maybe it's managing credit card data, or, or maybe it's, it's financially important, it's, it's managing accounts and transactions and so forth. So there is one module that you really care about. And you spend time reviewing that code and thinking about it, and maybe even using tools, maybe even, even program uh, theorem provers that, that, that show that the program has a certain property. Um, to show that, there is an invariant here, like all the transactions on the account balance out to zero, or there's a confidentiality property, the key, a key, a specific cryptographic key never leaves the module. Uh, these kinds of properties, the, the, the security property you care about. And you spend a lot of time checking the code, and you're sure it preserves the property, and then you run the program, and of course the property breaks. Why is that? Um, because, of course, it's not only your code that matters. What else do you need to trust? Uh, so, so, 
to, to be sure that, for example, the confidentiality of a key is not violated. Transport. Sorry? Transport. The communication. Between. Yes, but let, uh, that's true. So the network is part of the infrastructure too. But let's assume this is local. So we, we're not caring about the network yet. Yes, so suppose you put it in your module and you review it rigorously too and you're sure that it's fine. Shared memory. Yes, so that's a, a very valid point. So whatever is in the, in the same memory space as, you, as the module you reviewed is potentially critical. Yeah, what else? So that, that, that is definitely something you need. Even if you are reasoning on this code, you rely on the specs of the modules you depend on, any bug in these modules, definitely in C, but even in other languages under some circumstances, may, may, may mess up any kind of guarantee you have about your module. But there, there's much more, right? What else do you need to trust? Only yes, all the, all the, so, so actually you have to trust plenty of things. Uh, if your compiler is buggy, things will go wrong. If the other modules, somebody mentioned that, if the other modules have bugs, things will go wrong. If your operating system has bugs or vulnerabilities, things will go wrong. If the hardware has bugs or vulnerabilities, uh, so in general you could say you have to trust three big chunks of things. You have to trust your own reasoning. If you make mistakes reasoning about your module, you'll pay for them. Um, you need to uh, trust the implementations of the other modules. Um, you, may, you, you, you will always, when reasoning about code of one module, at some point give up and say, I'm not going to look at the code beyond that interface anymore and rely on the specs, but if there are bugs in that, then you, then you pay for it. And then finally, the execution infrastructure, which, is, which could in principle be very simple, but which is in practice always complicated. At least a compiler, uh, runtime libraries, an operating system, a processor, maybe shared by, with other um, operating systems and processes and so forth. Okay, and so the, actually this is, from, from one point of view, this is ridiculous. Um, so you could spend a lot of time reviewing your module, which is maybe a thousand lines of code, and then be sure that it's fine, and then you end up trusting 50 million lines of code, roughly, is the, is the things that we have red arrows to now. And bugs in any of them could also, in principle, cost you uh, the fact that the property that you care about is violated. And this is not just theory. I mean, these kind of things happen. Applications are attacked by attacking vulnerabilities in other modules, uh, hard bleed, by, uh, by attacking vul vulnerabilities in the operating system. Um, th 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 this is not um, some kind of theoretical exercise. It is, of course, true that these lines that you looked at will be more important than some of the lines of code in the operating system, but still any kind of issue here in principle might lead to a violation of, of your security property. And it's, it's to deal with this concern that protected module architectures have been invented. So what, essentially what we want uh, in the long term is, would it be possible to, to turn this situation into a better one, where if I checked my module and I verified it by code review or with tools, um, and I now execute it, the only thing that, that could still harm me to violate the property that I care about is the hardware. So only if the hardware is subverted, and that could also happen, but we have to trust something. Um, but any kind of, even if the OS is infected with malware, we want still to be able to get some security properties of the, of the code running on top of that. That's the goal, okay? Now to get all these things out of the trusted computing base, so or to, get, to make sure that we don't have to trust any of these things, this is, uh, th th there are several pieces of the puzzle necessary, and I'll focus in this talk on only one, uh, piece of the puzzle, which is the creation and attestation of these kinds of isolated protected modules within a legacy system. So, so how can you, within some existing system, create a, an, an isolation boundary for a part of a program, for one module of a program, uh, and, 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 and be sure, even when the rest of the system is infected with malware, that that program is running there, that uh, you can interact with that program and be sure that the responses you get are the right ones and so forth. Okay, so that's, that's only one aspect, piece of this puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle is, for example, yeah, what if you have bugs in the compiler, uh, then again, all bets are off, how could we deal with that? What if, if you have vulnerabilities in the module yourself, so your reasoning is not sound, can we, can we deal with that? I'm not gonna talk about those. So I'm just gonna talk about <laughs> how, we get, how we get this protection at runtime, because that's what things like IntelliJ offer you. And I will explain um, the mechanism not using IntelSGX, which is a, 
a more complex system, but using a similar system that was developed uh, here in Leuven for small embedded processors. Um, this is the, the Sanko system, uh, and you see a reference to a paper describing Sanko there, so if you want to know more about it, um, you can easily find uh, more detailed documentation. <coughs> okay. the, I want to stress that the basic ideas, the things I'll talk about, are the same for Sanko or for Intel SGX, but there are, let's say, implementation detail differences and a lot of additional complexity in Intel SGX. So, for example, Sanko will use symmetric key cryptography for efficiency purposes. SGX will also support um, a public key cryptography. Um, as, uh, uh, SGX, uh, sorry, Sankus doesn't have multi-threading, doesn't support multi-threading. SGX has um, solutions for dealing with multi-threaded code and so forth, but I won't talk about those. But what you hear about, Sankus almost directly also applies to SGX. It's just, let's say, a simple subset of, of SGX. Okay, so um, I just want to bring back this picture that some of you may have seen on Monday when we did... Uh, the, don't look at the details yet, when we, when we did uh, the intro course on uh, memory safety, on, on memory safety vulnerabilities. So keep in mind <coughs> what a program looks like at runtime these days. That's what I want to show with this picture. So what you see here is um, here, and I can zoom into it, the uh, uh, source code of some program. Sure. This is a very small toy server. And I, and I cut out some of the code and commented it out. Uh, the details of the code are not important here. That will get compiled. And here you see machine code, uh, assembly code and machine code, and a bit of explanation of what it's doing. And then you see here the actual, let me, let me zoom out again, the actual runtime state of the machine while it's executing this program. And you see that, um, uh, don't, don't look at the details, but if you, if, you, if you have time to look at the details, you see that this machine code is in one specific part of memory. Uh, the call stack tracking the various function calls through these, to this program is in another part of memory. The program is not using the heap, but if it was using the heap, that would be in this part of memory and so forth. Okay, so at runtime, when we want to do this kind of protection, yeah, when we want to isolate one module, um, we'll have to change this situation. Here, what we have here is all parts of a program are thrown together in one single virtual memory address space. And any kind of bug in any kind of the modules could in principle mess up everything. Okay, so we'll have to change that one way or another. So, so one example of how that's abused in practice is memory scraping. I, I assume many, many of you have heard about memory scraping attacks. So the idea of a memory scraping attack is that some sufficiently privileged layer, like the operating system or like parts of your program, so some, some software layer that, ha that can look at the memory space of your process, um, will search that memory for valuable data. And so there are, for example, techniques to search for um, cryptographic keys in memory. You, you can do that because you know they have high randomness. There are techniques to look for credit card numbers because they have a certain structure. And so this is one example of the kind of attack where the fact that you have to trust all these things may violate your secrets. You may store, so the code you see here, again, let me zoom in, is, 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 um, is in, is, is, this is a very small example, but it's a, a kind of a prototypical example of a piece of code that tries to maintain a secret. So what this does is it has a secret number, 666, so, but it could be a, a password manager or it could be medical records or it could be, uh, you, you see that in reality it would be bigger. And it tries to protect it in the sense that it offers access to it. Uh, and, but in order to get the, no, the secret back, you have to provide the correct pin and you only have three tries. And if you don't do it right in three tries, the thing dies. So that's a, a, an example of a, a piece of source code that tries to protect this secret. But clearly, if you compile it in, in the standard way as we, as, as we do today, well, the secret will be, uh, so in this case, the secret is a global um, uh, variable, so it will be in the static data section, um, so, so it will be somewhere here, and any kind of trusted code can, can have access to it. And, the, and, this, and, and so in, in the threat model that we consider, where everything outside our module is potentially owned by the attacker, all bets are off. And so the basic idea of um, protected modules is, what we'll do at runtime is, we'll add an isolation mechanism at runtime, so we'll have a, a kind of memory access control, a very simple kind of memory access control, uh, such that we can put the code and the state of a single module in an isolated area of memory. We call that a protected module. 
And then we, we make sure, and I'll go into details how the memory access control works, but this will allow us to make sure that only the machine code of the module can access the data of the module and nobody else. And then we have to limit the ways in which you can invoke this module. And we'll do that by, by having so-called entry points. So, so e code, even the operating system, but also other code of the program, cannot just jump anywhere into this module. It can only jump to a specific entry point. In this case, the entry point would be the get secret. And now, even if the operating system is malicious, it can have three tries to get out the secret and that's it. Um, it will not be able to just scrape the memory and, and, and find uh, the data. Okay, that's the basic ID. Now there are many details to be nailed down. Uh, for example, uh, one thing we, so I'll, I'll nail down in detail what the access control model is, so what are exactly the rules that the hardware enforces, but also we need to nail down how we can still communicate with this module, because um, uh, if I don't trust any of the infrastructure, uh, then any call I would do to this module could be intercepted by the operating system, and any result I get back might have been manipulated by the malicious operating system, so, so what value do we still have? So we need to solve that problem at the same time. We need to make sure that third parties that want to talk to this module can get strong assurance that the right module is running on that machine and that it's the right module that is giving answers to us. And for that, we'll need a, few, a bit of cryptography. Okay, so these are the two things I'll need to explain. How does the access control work and, and, and how do we make sure that we're talking to the right module? Okay, okay so I'll explain that in detail, or in some detail, um, for, for the Sankus um, approach, but as I said, it's it's conceptually very similar to the SGX approach. So in general, we'll consider a system consisting of a number of computers. We'll call them nodes. So for SGX, this would typically be a cloud-based system. So you have many computers in the cloud and you have an infrastructure provider, which would be the owner of that cloud system, for example. For Sankus, which is for small um, nodes, for small computers, this is typically, these are, for example, sensors. It's a sensor network and the infrastructure provider is the owner of the sensor network. But apart from that scale, uh, conceptually, th there is no difference. Um, so we have a number of these computers owned by a specific IP infrastructure provider. And then we have a variety of what we call software providers that don't necessarily trust each other. Uh, they're mutually distrustful. And they want to run software modules, either single modules or full applications. Uh, so you can install more than one module. You, you can link with modules uh, from other providers and so forth. So software providers try to install modules on the node um, to execute their applications on these nodes. Okay? And then we, co we consider um, attackers, very powerful attackers, that can first manipulate all the software on the nodes. So we assume that the attacker has the ability to take over the operating system, for example, because there's a buffer overflow somewhere in the operating system. Okay? So that's a very powerful attacker. Any kind of software on the node can be compromised. Um, the, the, the attacker also has complete control of the network. He can see all the messages, rearrange them, inject new messages. Um, he has full control, essentially, of the network. He can also take messages away and never have them reappear. Um, he can do anything he wants. There are only two things that the attacker cannot do. Um, he's a Dolefiao attacker, what, which means that, okay, he controls the network, but he cannot break crypto primitives. So, for example, he cannot invert a hash function, or he cannot decrypt an encrypted message for which he doesn't already have the key. Okay, and then we also assume that he doesn't do hardware level attacks. He's not able to put um, probes on the memory bus. He can't freeze the processor and then turn it off and see what's in memory. These kinds of attacks are also out of scope. I think I, I would claim that this is a, an attacker model that, that covers a lot of the important attacks for application scenarios like the Internet of Things, for example where um, we'll see many software related attacks and maybe network related attacks, but breaking crypto or actually attacking the hardware is, will also happen, no doubt, but will be less common than the other two kinds of attacks. So that's why this is a good threat model. Can the attacker extend the hardware, for example, um, so, so you could allow this, on the, so we don't consider, I will not talk about that, so I will not talk about uh, adding, for example, drivers and devices, uh, sorry, the drivers is okay, but adding devices to the, to the system, I will not talk about that. You can allow that under certain circumstances, um, but it's not something I will cover today. And it's also, so, so for example, um, uh, much of the, prote so the protection you get for SG from SGX, for example, it will allow you, it doesn't matter if you put an additional video card in your PC, but it would matter if you would open your PC and try to open the CPU package and, and, and look 
and look at the memory connections there, which is something that's clearly much harder to do. Okay, so uh, what do we want to have as a security objective in, for this system with this attacker model? We want iso strong isolation of software modules. So you can think of this, I'll, I'll make this more precise in a minute, but you can think of this, when a provider installs a module, it should be for the provider as if the, all the attacker modules are not there. We, we will not completely get this. So for example, in a, an attacker in this attacker model can always deny service. There is no way to guarantee availability yet. But in terms of confidentiality and integrity of, of data that we exchange with the application, it should be as if the attacker is not there. We want remote attestation. That's the property where if I'm talking to my module, I know it's my module that's running there. Um, and secure remote communication means when I'm, a, when I'm sending input to my module and getting back a reply, I have to be sure it actually comes from my code that I installed on that machine and not any tampered code. Th these are the kind of properties we want. And, and Suncruise and NSGX offer more that I won't talk about. So for example, how you can link modules to build an entire application. Uh, I, I'm, I will not zoom into these. I think these are the, the most basic and essential ones. Okay, so in order to explain you how to do this, I have to say a little bit about what a software module is, and that's very standard. So a software module is like a DLL file or an ELF file in, Lin in Linux. So it describes uh, a, a part of a, your application that the loader could load. Um, in, in, so it consists of a number of sections that will correspond to parts of memory that will be allocated to these sections. And we'll, so you can have many of them, but we'll consider only two that's sufficient to write uh, a module and it's, it's all we care about from, from the point of view of security. So we'll have a text section which contains code and constants and we're gonna assume that the code and these constants are not secret. They can be seen by anybody. Um, uh, so this, is, this, this will be readable by the attacker, um, but not changeable. And then we have a private data section um, this describes the area in memory where data will be um, that, that, should be, that should remain confidential from the attacker, okay? Um, we call the layout of a module is the ad addresses of each of its sections. So for simplicity, I will only consider modules with two sections um, in this talk. So that means that the layout is four addresses, start and end of the code section and start and end of the data section. Okay? And then the identity of a module, and this is the kind of thing that we will want to authenticate when I say I want to be sure my module is running there, then, then my module is defined by this notion of identity. Um, so the identity of a module is the layout, so where is it in memory, as well as the contents of the text section. So the identity of a module is what machine code is it, and where is it in memory. Okay? That's the guarantee you get. Um, when, you, when you do remote attestation, for example, when you're communicating with a module and you say, okay, it's my module, then you know it was this initial machine code and it's at these locations in memory. That's what you, what you know. Okay, so then I can explain you how access control works after things have bootstrapped. Um, and I'll come back to how things gets boot, get bootstrapped in a minute because that's part of the tricky uh, uh, things. Because if you can't trust the OS, how do you load anything without messing things up? But once things are bootstrapped, here is how memory-based uh, how the memory access control works. So how we ensure isolation while the application is running. Um, so the processor there is a, there is a hardware extension to the microprocessor. So Sunquiz is built as an extension of a, an MSP430 microprocessor, and, and Intel SGX is built as an extension of the Intel X64 uh, platform. Um, so there is an extension where the processor maintains a bit of information about what modules are loaded. Um, and this is in an area of the processor that is not directly accessible to software, clearly. Um, so we call that the protected storage area. And so one of the things it maintains there is metadata per module. And so here we see one module, uh, one software module SM1 that has a code section here and a data section here. And we see that one of the things that the protected storage area stores as metadata is the layout of the module, okay? All, all the things in red here together is what I called the identity of a module before. It's the layout plus the contents of this, um, of this code section, of this text section. And what is the access control rule? So while things are running, there can be many of these modules. I'm only showing one. But the rule is um, it, 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 the memory access control is what, what is called program counter based. So what you can access depends on where, on where the program counter is at this moment in time. So, if the program counter is within the code section of a specific module, that's the first row of this table, then it can read and execute code, and it can read and write 
data of that module. Okay? If the program counter is outside of the code section of a specific module, in another module or in unprotected memory, where there is no module loaded, then the second access control row here matters. So what you can do is you can do anything to the code section of this module and you can do anything to the data section of this module. The only thing you can do is start executing the module at the entry point. So that's the way how you transition from being outside of the module to being inside of the module. Okay? So I think it's a very simple access control model and, and, and the basic isolation guarantee that it gives us is the following. Um, the state of the module can only be manipulated by the code of the module. Yes? Um, I was wondering how to snap uh, the virtualization. Like, uh, you have the public part, and you know, so yeah. you can play with that, with the migration. Um, but you have two things. One, you, you have lightning migration, that you're going to go from one hardware to the other, just like that, with yeah. computers and the and, and, and VMware. Yes. And also, you have file virtualization, where the CPU is kind of direct, directly accessed Yeah. So does this system work in, in that kind of environment? That's a very good question. So, so wait. Um, so first, the system I'm talking about here is for an MSP430. It doesn't have virtual memory. It doesn't have any kind of virtualization. So clearly here, there's nothing you can do. For, um, so, well, it just doesn't exist. Um, and there is no mechanism to, for example, transparently uh, move your virtual machine to another uh, CPU, for example. Uh, for Intel SGX, um, the protection is if you define uh, an, an enclave, as it is called in SGX, so uh, what I call a protected module is called an enclave in SGX, is an area of physical memory. So by playing with virtual memory, there is no way to bypass this. So, so, so because if, if you could do that, if you could remap virtual memory to get access, then the operating system would be trusted again. Okay? So, but that means, I think this essentially means that, trans that transporting an application that uses such an enclave as one of its modules uh, that that cannot be done. Um, I, I know actually this is a topic on which one of our master thesis students worked last year to come up with proposals to do these kinds of things. And so there are research proposals, but I don't think this works in practice at the moment. I think if you, actually even, it's even worse than that. Um, the problem of securely storing the state on the same machine and then rebooting and starting the thing again is something tricky. So there are some solutions there, but the, the solutions used today are vulnerable to what is called um, rollback attacks. So you can have the module use a stale state, and there is research on how to deal with that. So these, are not, these things are not uh, fully solved, I would say. There are ideas on how to do this, but I, don't, if you, I think if you, if you would use it today, uh, you cannot migrate your machines transparently. Okay, other questions on the access control model? So, so this is essentially the, the, the simple part. I'll come back to how these keys get here and what they mean in a minute. So we'll, we'll look at that when we talk about uh, bootstrapping of the system. And in order to understand the bootstrapping, I have to tell you a little bit about the different cryptographic keys that are used because bootstrapping will at the same time set keys that the module can use to authenticate. So the, the Sanko system I'm describing here uses, as I mentioned before, strictly symmetric keys because it's such a small processor. In SGX, you will also have a public key um, way of uh, doing key management. Um, and Sanko supports three types of keys. It's a relatively simple key management scheme, but, you, well, three types uh, that are distinguish, distinguished by the indices. So the first type of key has one index. index. It's called a node master key, and it's shared between a node and the infrastructure provider. So remember, the infrastructure provider is the one that owns all the computers. He has a database with all his computers and the corresponding node key, and each node has its own node key. And on the picture here, the node key was here. So every node has its own node key. That's layer one of the key management uh, scheme. Second is provider keys, uh, two indices. So the pro a provider key, you should think of it as a shared secret between a node and a software provider. Right? The IP will also know it. The infrastructure provider here is a trusted third party, so he'll know everything. But the intention is that this key will be used by the node and by the software provider. to do, so, to do uh, This will be a secret that only the, the two of them know. And the, reason, the way in which we get this easily is by deriving 
the, the software provider key from the node key and the name of the software provider. Mm -hmm. So by doing it this way, if you only have the node key initially, so that's the infrastructure provider and the node, then you can derive a key for any software provider that you might ever want to support. Okay? So what the software provider needs to do is buy this key from the infrastructure provider. Essentially, by buying this key, you get the right to install stuff on these nodes. Um, so you buy a, a license to run something on the cloud, or you buy a license to install something on a sensor network. Um, the node itself can always compute for any kind of software provider the corresponding key, because this key derivation function will be implemented in hardware in the processor. So without using any software, for any kind of software provider, the node can compute the corresponding um, software provider key. And then the third type of key, and that's the most novel kind of key, let's say, is what is called the module key. It has three indices, and you should think of it as the key shared between a software provider and a specific software module, with the notion of identity I mentioned before, running on a specific node on behalf of that software provider. Okay? So when I talk about key management in the following slides, you should, you should keep in mind that the goal is, the objective is, that this key should only be usable by that specific software module on that specific node and by no other code. If you find a way where the operating system, for example, could use this code, you would have found a vulnerability. Uh, so we'll try to make things such that this key is only owned by the software provider and by the actual protected running module with that specific identity on the road. And then you, you easily see that we can use that to do remote attestation or, or secure communication between the software provider. So the, the challenge is to maintain that invariant, that this key will only be owned by that specific module. That, that's the main challenge. So how do we get this uh, invariant? And this is about how things uh, bootstrap or start up. Um, so, uh, first thing is, uh, your module, you load it through untrusted network and untrusted operating system. So before, uh, th so at the moment you deploy your code, that's why code has to be public. There have to be no secrets in the code itself. Any kind of secret you have to provision later uh, uh, through the private data section. Um, so you, 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 you try to load the best effort using untrusted services, the code in memory. Uh, and then at one point, there is a critical point um, where the, the processor will call a protect instruction. This is a new hardware instruction added to the CPU, and it has the following effects. Um, so it gets a layout, so these are these four pointers, and the name of a software provider. And what it does is two things. It uh, sets up the isolation. So after the protect instruction, the isolation model, the, the memory access control model I talked about before is activated. And secondly, it computes this key using the key derivation function specified here. So again, in the hardware here, there is crypto hardware that can, from the node key, the software provider name, and the identity of this module, which is um, the, the code and constant plus these four pointers, uh, all the data is here, and there's a hardware uh, circuit in the processor that computes the corresponding module key. And now you can see that suppose the attacker tampered with the code before loading, and there are many things the attacker could try. He could try to modify this code. He could try to shift the data section so that this code would be writing stuff in unprotected memory instead of in protected memory. There, there are many things he could try. But whatever the attacker would try, this would change this key. Because if you shift this, the layout changes, the key changes. If you tamper with this, the identity changes, the key changes. Yeah? So, so, so by, by having the loading of the module and the, the derivation of the corresponding key together in one machine instruction, uh, you get the property that indeed only if the untempered module is loaded correctly, then this key will be available. And then the next question is available to who? So remember this key should only be available to this module. And that is enforced by having this key only accessible, again, to a, a number of uh, new hardware instructions. So the processor has instructions to work with these keys. For example, one instruction is an instruction to compute message authentication codes with that key, uh, to do integrity protection. Uh, so that instruction loop looks like this. Max seal, then the start address and the length of the, of the data that you want to compute the MAC for. And then a result address where you should write that MAC. And the semantics of this instruction is, if it is called from outside of any module, from unprotected code, it, it, it fails. It gives you an error. If it is called from within a specific soft, uh, protected module, 
then automatically this instruction will use the corresponding key. So if it's called from SM1, it will use the key for SM1. If it's called from SMN, it will use the key from SMN. Okay? And that's how you are sure. The only way to use this key is by using these instructions. And these instructions are designed such that when you use them, they always use the appropriate, they only use that appropriate key. So there is no way for any other code, operating system or other modules to ever do anything with this key, with this key because of the way we, we essentially implemented the hardware instructions. Is that clear? Questions on that? So that, that's the key ID of... Uh, So the, the, uh, again, this instruction, uh, the, the effect of this instruction is two things, turning on the, and that's essential because if you wouldn't turn on the protection at the same time or, or before you derive this key, then you could have a, an attack where the key is derived and then later somebody tampers with the code. I understand, but who is calling that instruction? Uh, that can be on trusted code. So the, the operating system can call this. Um, uh, so the, on, the operating system will load everything, and uh, uh, if there's an attacker, things will fail later, but, but, uh, but let's assume there's no attacker, then things will continue. Um, and then at some point it will call protect, and then the, as soon as the uh, software provider has been able to exchange a first message with the software module, he knows everything worked. If the attacker had messed with things, he will never be able to talk to the module, so availability is not guaranteed, but, but if communication succeeds, you know it's with the right module. Okay, yeah, what will happen? So what will happen if the OS doesn't call protect? Very good question. So what does protect do? Two things, it sets the access control and it derives this key. So if, if, you, if you don't call protect, this key will just not be available on the node. Nobody can compute it. Um, and so, uh, well, okay, I should explain how the software provider talks to the module because the, what the software provider will do whenever it talks to the module is of course use this key. So the, internally, the code can be assured that all is fine because of the internal memory access control. As soon as you want to communicate something outside, you'll have to use this key. And that's actually on the next slide. So here you see, so, so how would the software provider um, check whether his module is correctly running? Well, that's the simplest case where you just send the nonce. The module will calculate um, a MAC, a message authentication code on that nonce, and will send it back. There's no input and output in that case. Um, and if the software provider sees, okay, somebody has been able to use this key, then it must have been my module. If you don't get a response, you know nothing. And if you wanna, if you wanna do re secure communication, it's, it's essentially the same idea. You send a nonce and some input. The module can compute something for you, for example, an aggregate of sensor readings. Uh, will send the output back to you together with a MAC of the nonce you sent, the input you sent, and the output you sent, so that you know that nothing was tampered with. And if you get this and the Mac checks out, then you know, okay, this was given to me by a module that has this key. And because of the way we bootstrap things, there's only one thing that could have had this key in that. Does that answer your question? Yes, uh, but does that have an additional one? Can you do, do the same as Mac? Meaning that if you didn't enable the protection, you can access all of that memory and compute it yourself? Yes, so, so if you didn't enable protection, the semantics of Mac seal, if you would call it from unprotected code, so remember the processor knows what are areas are protected and what not through this. So if Mac seal is called and it's not called from within a protected module, it just fails. It doesn't do anything. Yeah, but I find that as well. I don't call Mac seal. I call my own function. Yeah, but then, you, then where do you get this key? So in order to compute Mac seal with this key, you need to get this key. And to get this key, you need the node key which, which is in hardware and you can't get to it from software. So if you can tamper with the hardware, if you, can temp if you can change the hardware such that it would compute this key for you, you're right, that's an attack. But we assume that um, you can't tamper with the hardware and the, hard the only thing the hardware allows you to do with this key are the things I described. The software provider? Have to know that. No, so, so the software provider, Remember, the software provider buys this key from the infrastructure provider, um, uh, and then he can compute for any of his modules. He knows the identity of his module. He can compute the corresponding module key. You are right that the infrastructure provider, who also has all the keys, he could cheat here. So we trust the infrastructure provider. If the, the infrastructure provider, so if this message comes back, what we essentially know is it's either the module or a, a fake infrastructure provider. 
Okay. Other, so, so I think this is the main, so I, I, with this you understand the main idea. So the main idea of these protected modules is uh, you have a way to isolate modules such that only the module's code can modify the module state. And you have a way of associating a key with modules such that only that module on that specific computer could have that key, and then you can, you can authenticate it. And, that, and these, these, these two basic primitives are offered by all the implementations of protected module architectures. Okay? So, so yeah, maybe in the interest of time, I should not say too much about the implementation. So you can find information. I have references at the end where you can find information about SJX. Um, if, you, uh, if you want more information about our own prototype, it's completely open source, including the hardware. So you can download even the hardware description and burn it to an FG FPGA, including a supporting compiler that will make use of these um, hardware features and so forth from the URL that you see over there. Okay, so that wraps up the first part. So uh, the thing I talked about, Sankus is a low-cost security architecture for these kinds of networked embedded systems. Um, uh, it provides module isolation through this program counter-based access control, and it provides remote attestation and secure communication by using this hierarchical three-layer symmetric key derivation scheme. Um, okay, so I hope you can see now that um, if we have a module like the one I talked about for this program that I've shown you that tries to maintain a secret, that now we can indeed maintain that secret. Because now what uh, the software provider can do, he can call the entry point um, and, and try with a specific bin and get out the secret. But the operating system can't do anything. Uh, it could try maybe to call the entry point a few times, but then uh, it would soon get into a state where it doesn't want to respond anymore. Okay. So, so the memory scraping style attack is one of the things that can be solved. There are many others. Uh, hard bleed style attack, for example, would also be solved. Uh, or you could also solve it with this kind of protection. Okay, I'm gonna skip. So there are many open problems uh, that I'm gonna skip. Um, one of, some of them were mentioned. So an interesting one is secure persistent storage and that's related to state transfer. So if you wanna transfer um, essentially an application from one machine to another, you need to make sure that you can get the state out and to the other side. And that's the similar problem to putting the state onto disk and then rebooting later. And that's uh, research on how to do that. So there are approaches for this, but they're all known to still have some, um, some, some open, some attacks that are possible and people are working on better protection. Um, Another important problem is um, what if the attackers use this? So any kind of security technology that you offer, there's always the risk that it's used against you, right? It's like weapons. Um, so w malware could use this to hide itself in a way that the operating system can't see it anymore or can't mess with it anymore. Right? That's a serious problem and how do we deal with that? I don't think we know yet how to deal with that well. Uh, so Intel now deals with it by essentially only allowing you to load enclaves that have been signed by a key that they approved. Um, and that's also a way they can make money of this, I think, because now you have to buy uh, a key, essentially, in order to be able to load uh, things. And then, uh, similarly in Sankus, a uh, software provider has to buy a key in order to be able to load something. Um, and so that way you may be able to have at least a first line of defense against malware, but it's pretty likely that we will see malware that tries to hide in enclaves um, in, the coming, in the coming years. And it's an interesting, uh, an interesting open problem how to deal with that. And there are many others. Um, uh, so this is really for, this is, I think on the one hand this is amazing that you can do this, that you can run a piece of code and be sure that it's fine without trusting any of the infrastructure. On the other hand, I mean, this is still a bit, this is transitioning from research into practice as we speak. So, so don't expect this to be something that you can, uh, push button technology that you can use uh, today. Okay, that finishes my first um, topic. I'm sure I will not get to the third, but I would like to get through the second. Um, unless there are any questions or other comments on protected modules. If not, we'll switch topics completely. Um, with, we're gonna talk about uh, safe uh, systems programming languages now. It's uh, completely um, different uh, topic, so don't worry if you didn't follow all the details of the keys, for example, uh, of the previous part. So what, what is the, the thing we wanna discuss here? So, we all know that uh, safe languages are significantly better from a security point of view. So, so why didn't C disappear? Uh, we know that C has problems since 30 years and still C is, 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 is as alive as, as, uh, as possible. There are several reasons for that. Um, 
and I'm, I don't claim to be complete here, but a few of them are at least, that C is very lightweight and that you could take that to mean that it has very good performance, but it also means things like when you take a C uh, for a program, you compile it, you get a little bit of machine code and you can just execute that and it works. You don't need any kind of supporting runtime system or so if you have Java, you have the virtual machine, you have the garbage collector, there's a lot of extra stuff you need just in order to run your code. You see, that's not the case. And that's, that's sometimes a big disadvantage. For example, that's the reason why all languages that offer uh, a foreign function interface, uh, to, to call functions in other languages, they, they all offer it to C. Because, yeah, you can tag on C to any other programming language, but to, you can't tag on Java to C Sharp easily unless you share, you, you, you share the virtual machine, of course. Okay? So, so the fact that, that C can be, the fact that C is close to the machine, essentially, means it can be performant and it can be, um, run without a lot of infrastructure around it, without uh, runtime, garbage collector, virtual machine, and so forth. And the second thing is, in C, you know where your memory is. Right? So as a programmer, you decide where and what you allocate. You decide when you deallocate it, or at least it's clear when it gets deallocated. It's deterministic when it gets deallocated. That's not the case for these garbage collected languages. So languages like Java, C Sharp, Scala. Um, so, so for instance, a garbage collector may copy your memory around and there may be plenty of copies of the, and if you have a secret in that, in that um, memory, that might be a concern to you. But you have no, as a programmer, you have no control over that. Right? You do have that in C. And of course, there, there are solutions for this. I mean, the, the garbage collection people have found a way, many different kinds of garbage collectors that, that have advantages and disadvantages, but still the, 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 the the fact that you, you lose this kind of simplicity that you have with C is, 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 I think, an important disadvantage. So what Rust is, is it's a representative of a new line of programming languages. Again, research about these kinds of languages has been going on for at least a decade, probably more. But Rust is special in the sense that it, it seems to be really taking on. The fact that about half of you know the language is an indication that the language is indeed uh, ready to transition to practice. So what is Rust? This is a snapshot of the, of the Rust Lang website. I have a reference at the end of the talk. Uh, so I encourage you to go there. Rust is a language, uh, so blazingly fast and zero cost abstractions are the two keywords. So you, you have um, uh, the lightweight nature of C. Um, it has many features, type inference, pattern manage, ma uh, matching, traits and so forth that I will not talk about. I will only focus on one aspect of the language the, the things that gives us memory safety. I'll, I'll, I'll zoom in on it in a minute. But I encourage you to go and check out the language for the other features too. I mean, it's a nicely designed language. Um, and and the, the website is nice. You can, you can just look at code, uh, interactively edit it, and immediately execute it on the website. So you can play with the language very quickly and get a feeling for what you can do. Um, so I will focus here only on one aspect. I think that's the most innovative aspect, but also the most complex aspect of the language. That is, it's ownership type system or the notion of ownership and borrowing or some kind call it um, a resource aware type system or a linear type system. That's something that many day-to-day -day programmers are not familiar with and it's typically the, the first thing you bump into when you're trying to learn to program Rust. Okay? Um, and an important advantage of this complexity of having these ownership types is that they also solve a, a big um, uh, a significant fraction of concurrency related errors for you. So you cannot have data races in Rust just like you cannot have memory safety vulnerabilities. And that's maybe one of the reasons why the language is popular is because concurrency related errors is also something that many, uh, well, code is getting more and more concurrent and it's something that many practical programmers uh, struggle with. So that's an additional benefit that I won't zoom into, but that may be a reason for you to look at the language in a bit more detail. So again, let's look at um, runtime program state. Uh, you saw this picture before. Um, so, so memory safety, the problem of memory safety is the fact that this program can write to memory cells using assignments, right? But in, pra in practice, the memory cells that it can actually write to, that it should be writing to, is only a very small fraction of the entire virtual memory address space. So for, for example, for this program, the only memory cells that the program could write arbitrary data to are the ones I marked in green there. And all the rest, either it should never write to through an assignment or it should only write to in some constrained way. So this shows the essence of the problem of memory safety. Um, 
we should make sure that when this program is writing to memory through assignments, uh, that it's not messing up a part of memory where we may have important stuff stored like code or like return addresses or like pointers that shouldn't point out to arbitrary places and so forth. So that's the issue of memory safety. Um, and I don't want to repeat too much of what, what, what I talked about on Monday, but essentially memory safety issues, so the fact that the program will be tampering with memory that it shouldn't be tampering with, can enter into a program only in four ways. And so we'll, I'll discuss how Rust deals with each of them. Um, so one way in which uh, memory uh, safety errors can enter a program is spatial memory safety vulnerabilities. That is the situation where the program allocates a blob of memory, say an array or a struct, and it then indexes into it, either using integers for an array or field names for a struct. Um, if, it, if it indexes out of the bounds of the allocated blob, then you might be writing to non-green cells, uh, to cells that you shouldn't be touching. That's a spatial memory safety error. Temporal memory safety errors is you allocate a blob of memory and you, you get a pointer to it, and you hold on to the pointer and the program continues and other parts of the program get pointers to this memory. And at some point, one part of the program frees it, but you, another part still has the pointer in its hands and dereferences it. Then you're actually accessing memory that was there once, but is, is gone now. You shouldn't be right. That's called a temporal memory safety error or a dangling pointer or a use after free. I mean, there are many names. Uh, the third way in which things can go wrong is pointer forging. So if, if the language allows you to create arbitrary pointers, for example, by casting from integers or, for example, by using in uninitialized memory, if you have an array of pointers and it's uninitialized and you just start dereferencing these pointers, you will be in trouble. You'll be accessing essentially random locations of memory. Or, and finally, you can have unsafe primitive API functions. Uh, the prototypical example is C sprint F where to the, to the format string, essentially, you can ask the, the function to traverse memory for you. And that's inherently unsafe. Now, if you have the, the liberty of redesigning the language, what the C, uh, sorry, what the Rust um, designers had, of course, getting rid of these two is relatively simple. Uh, you, you, you decide what kind of API you want to offer, and you make sure that you don't have these dangerous uh, uh, primitive API functions. You can deal with this by disallowing casts that C would warn for, for example, and by making sure that memory is always initialized uh, before you read it. Uh, these are known things, uh, so I'm not going to zoom into those. So let's look in a bit more detail at spatial and temporal memory safety. So I said spatial memory safety is indexing into an, a blob that you allocated, and that can take many forms. These can be arrays, can be pointer arithmetic, it can be a struct that you're indexing into. The C compiler will compile this into, again, an integer index into an allocated blob of memory. Um, so how do you pr protect against this? How would the compiler protect against this? I think you all know this. Generic. Sorry? By? The C, the C compiler doesn't, right. But, but other languages do, and the techniques that other languages use are actually ad quite adequate. Um, it's a combination of type checking and um, uh, runtime bounds checking, right? So, so, for example, the fact that you, in Java, that you cannot access a field that's not there is something that's checked by the type checker, and there's no runtime check necessary for it, so a field access can never go out of bounds. And you can do the same for a C-like language that will work. It, has no, it, has, it only has a uh, type checking overhead. There is no runtime overhead. For arrays and for more dynamically sized um, blobs of memory, you may sometimes need runtime checking. Again, depending on how you design the, the language, sometimes you can do array bounds checks statically. Rust will to try to do as many of them as possible statically. But there will always be cases where you need to do it dynamically, where essentially then you store with the blob of memory what the bounds are, and you do a runtime check before dereferencing it. And you can do that in C with something like fat pointers, and Java does it by default, um, and Rust mixes. If it knows statically what the bounds are and that you will, will not access out, out of bounds, it will do it statically, otherwise it will do it at runtime. So this is something, you pay a small performance penalty for this, but it's probably valid to say that even in C, where the compiler doesn't do it for you, in most cases you would have to do it yourself. Um, so the performance cost of, of this kind of spatial checking is very acceptable, and there's actually no, yes, Yes. Less than length, the compiler can hoist the check out of the loop, which makes the process. Yes, valid point. And Rust does the same. So to make sure that you minimize the amount of bounce checks, um, the, the, the compiler optimizations that you can use. So the cost of this 
is probably acceptable. I, I, the, the Rust side probably has performance measurements that show how they compare to C, and, 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 and this is not what will, um, what will be the dominating factor. So the interesting thing is temporal memory safety. Um, and so for temporal, mem temporal memory safety bugs are trickier than um, spatial memory safety bugs. So first thing you need to understand is how long pointers are valid. Um, uh, because of uh, uh, temporal memory safety bus bug is using a pointer after it has become invalid. So when do they become invalid? So here is a very simple program. We have a global um, variable, a parameter, a local variable, and a dynamically allocated um, piece of memory. And we make pointers to each of them. Um, how long are they valid? How long is P1 valid? Always, yeah, the entire, the entire lifetime of the program. The uh, uh, a global variable lives for the entire lifetime of the program. Uh, how long is P2 valid? Until you free it, yeah, exactly. Um, and how long are P3 and P4 valid? Yes, so you, you should never return these because a, a, a local variable or a parameter only lives as long as the invocation of the function. So taking an address of it and returning it, uh, most C compilers will warn you for this, uh, that is probably not what you want to do because you immediately have a dangling pointer. So, so um, uh, the, the most typical case of temporal safety bugs is, is the, with dynamic memory, when you malloc and then free, and so you have to make sure that after you free it, you don't access it anymore. And the difficulty is usually that you have a bunch of pointers into the same data structure, and you're changing the data structure from one pointer and as a consequence of that, one of the other data pointers becomes dangling. And here is a very simple example of that. Um, so I'll ask you where the mem temporal memory safety bug is um, after I went through the program, so look for it. So, so what I implement here is a, a simple type of growable vector. So a vector has a length, that's how much, it's only, in, it's a growable vector of integers. So the length says how many integers are in the vector. The capacity says for how many do I have space at this point in time. And then there's an array data that has capacity spaces where you put the integers that you want to store. Right? This is a very typical growable uh, vector. So if we initialize one, we set the length to zero, we start with an array that has space for two integers, so we set the capacity to two. If we push an additional element into a vector, um, what we need to do is increase the length and store the, the value in the data array. That's typically what we have to do. And of course, if the, if the data array is full, we have to do more. So if, if the length becomes equal to the capacity, then we double the capacity, we malloc a bigger array to store the vector, we mem copy the old array into the new array, we free the old array, and then we um, remember the new array. And again, for those of you who program C, this should be, I, I hope this will be easy code. If you don't program C, ask questions if, you, if, if something is unclear. This is a simple helper function that prints out the content of a vector at some point. And this is a function that allows you to get an additional pointer to one of the elements of the vector. So here you, you get a pointer to the i -th element of the vector. So by, you, by calling get, vec v, uh, sorry, get v i, you get a pointer to the i -th element of the vector. So, so that, that's what this gives you. And now we walk through the vector and we, do, we create one. We push a zero on it, we print it, this would print zero. Uh, we get a pointer to the first element, we store a 10 in it now, we print it, so this would now print 10. Um, then we push one, two, three onto the vector yeah, in a loop. So we push two, we push one, we push two, we push three. We print it, so this would print 10, one, two, three. Then we change the zeroth element again to 20, and we print the, the vector again. That's the problem. Where is the temporal memory safety bug? Exactly. Who, who sees that? So who sees where the temporal memory safety bug is? Three, four people? So, uh, so, so this is a simple example, but it's a typical example, and it shows that these are not that easy to find. So let me walk you through the example, because there are only four people who raised their hands. I'll quickly go to, to the main method again. So and you see here what's happening on memory, and I, I will use these kinds of pictures when I talk about Rust 2, so it's good to get used to these kinds of pictures. Um, so what, when we allocate a new vector here, we get a structure on the stack, which has the length, the capacity, and a pointer to the data array. Yeah? So now I push zero onto it, the length will become one, and this first element here will contain a zero. I print it, and it will print zero. Yeah? Uh, now I get a pointer to the zeroth element, and I will get a pointer to this memory cell. Okay? 
So I0 is, a low, is again a stack allocated variable that has a pointer to this first element of this array. And now something interesting happens. Uh, so I print it, it prints 10 as you, as you would expect. And now I push one, two, and three. So if I push the one, that's still easy. I put it here and the length becomes two and all is fine. But as soon as I push the two, I'm in the scenario where the current data array is too small. So what will happen is a new one will be allocated. The capacity will be reset to four. The old data will be copied and the two and the three will be put in this new array. And the old one gets freed. But and now here you see uh, what was mentioned that of course the, this, this pointer doesn't get updated um, automatically. Uh, and, and now it has become a dangling pointer. So I can now still print this and it will print correctly. But when I try to do this, I'm now writing 20 to an area of memory that's not allocated to my program anymore and it's a temporal memory shape. Okay, so this is, this is a simple example, but it's, I, I would say it's prototypical. So you have a data structure with pointers, you're, you're changing it through one pointer, and as a consequence, another pointer into it becomes dangling. And this is easy to see, but a real heap looks a bit more complicated. So this is a snapshot of the heap of a somewhat more complicated program, where all the, the rectangles here are blobs of allocated memory, and the arrows are pointers to these blobs. And clearly, it gets tricky after, unless you have a very good mental model of what you're doing with your data structures on the heap, it's tricky to make sure that if you're re rearranging a data structure and freeing some things, that there are not any pending pointers to it. This is a tricky uh, thing to get right, that <coughs> experience tells us that. And so this is what um, uh, temporal, temporal memory safety, uh, what introduces temporal memory safety vulnerabilities. So again, how do we deal with that? We, we know how this can be dealt with through Java uh, and C Sharp. Uh, so the, the classic approach is garbage collection. So this means you cannot do free yourself. So in principle, this means memory lives forever. Conceptually, once you allocate something, it's always there. Uh, and then you cannot have these, this situation like we had here, right? Uh, we would just keep this allocated. It might still be a bug in your program, but it will not be a memory safety vulnerability anymore. Yeah. Um, so, so um, but of course, just never calling free would then lead to memory leaks, right? Because then nothing ever gets deallocated and that's also not what you want. So that's where the garbage collector comes in. At regular times, the, 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 your program will be halted and a program on the site will run. And what it essentially will do, it, it will start from all the local variables that are still accessible in your program and it will follow pointers and mark everything in the heap that is accessible and everything that's no way that you can ever reach again will be deallocated. That's called garbage and that's, and that's deallocated. So that's nice. Uh, there's also, this is one of the nice results from computer science. There are many different strategies to do that with many different pros and cons. But for systems programming, so for some areas of programming, the fact that this means that memory can be copied around without you knowing, uh, less precise control over memory, and the fact that your program may be stopped to, to do the garbage collection can be a, can be a killer. It can be a showstopper, essentially. Okay. So this is what Rust tries to solve. So, so Rust tries to give you memory safety, but without the garbage collection. Okay. So the, the new idea is the following. So, so this is where the, the ownership types and the borrowing from Rust come in. Uh, so, th so the key idea is we will make sure. So uh, uh, I'll start with a very simple story about how Rust wor works and we'll add complexity as we go along. In the simplest scenario, um, you, you make sure that every blob of allocated memory has a unique owning pointer to it. Yeah? And for the moment, we'll only consider owning pointers. So you can think of Rust ensuring that every blob of memory has only a single pointer to it. Okay? And then we'll see that there can be non-owning pointers and we'll get more flexible and so forth. Okay? But if you have that invariant, if you, invariant, if you have the invariant that every blob of memory only has one pointer to it, you can determine when you should deallocate something. For example, um, if a variable has a pointer to a blob of allocated memory and you know it's the only one that is in the program and the variable goes out of scope or something else gets assigned to the variable, so this pointer disappears, then you know that you can free the blob of memory. And if that blob of memory had pointers to other stuff, you can also free that because if it had a pointer, it had to be the only one, so you can, you can free what, what it is pointing to and so forth. So that's how Rust, in first approximation, will make memory deallocation predictable. 
when 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 point when unique pointers disappear because a variable goes out of scope or because you assign something over it or for some other reason, at that point the memory gets deallocated. So as a programmer, you can know exactly when the compiler essentially will insert a call to free for you. So here is uh, um, how this works in Rust. Um, so in Rust, as a programmer, you control um, where you allocate memory. Uh, sorry, at what time you allocate memory, where you allocate it on the stack on the heap, and when it gets deallocated. Uh, this is done by the compiler, but as a programmer you can predict when it will be deallocated. You cannot indicate where it has to free it. The compiler will do it for you, but you can know when it will be deallocated. So you still have the, 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 the low-level understanding of what's happening with memory. So here's a very simple example. Um, this is a Rust program. I will only work with integers uh, in Rust for simplicity. This declares a local variable x that allocates an integer on the stack. And this annotation, so this makes a box type. I'm, I don't want to go into the details of the type system, but so think of this as an annotation that tells Rust to allocate this on the heap. So this is an alloc. Um, and y becomes a pointer to uh, this cell on the heap. Okay, and these are the only constructs I will use in, the, in, in, in my account of how Rust deals with um, memory deallocation. Okay, so um, uh, we can, as soon as, the, uh, for main it's easy, if this would be another function, um, even uh, at this point we could be sure that we could deallocate uh, this cell here because this would go out of scope. It's the only pointer that exists to it, so a free could be injected here. And so this is a good, um, uh, uh, way of working because it, it kind of makes use after free impossible uh, because as soon as you if, if a variable like this one here so this x also uh, has a pointer to and one on the heap I can use it to for example print the contents of that cell but as soon if I go out of scope if this variable goes out of scope and we knew it had a unique pointer to the cell we can free here, so here the compiler will insert a free for you, and that's okay because there's no way to use the pointer afterwards. You, you could not write something like this because the compiler would say, what x do you mean? There is no x in scope here. There's no way to refer to the pointer anymore. Okay? So, so um, of course, the, the, I, I imagine that the first question you would ask is, yeah, but what if we copy the pointer? Huh? So it's easy to have a unique pointer when you allocate something the first time, but of course, the, the through assignments, through passing into, into functions and so forth, by storing into structures, you may end up with many copies of the pointer. So what will happen there? Well, um, Rust's answer is to have move semantics. So you cannot copy pointers. If you, you move a pointer from one location to another one. If you assign some, a pointer to another variable, um, then it, it moves from here to here. It doesn't get copied from here to here. So let's see what that means. So here we see a program that allocates a 2 on the heap and, and there's a pointer to it in Y. Um, in, a, in a smaller scope, it will um, allocate a 1 on the heap and uh, a pointer on the stack that points to it. Uh, I can now print this and this would print 1. And if I now do the assignment, if I do this assignment, you might expect that we now have two pointers to one, uh, so I would assign x the pointer here to y, so, so now it seems like we would have two pointers. Well, that's not what happens. What happens is the pointer is moved from x to y, and the, and the compiler will consider x now as unusable anymore, as moved. Okay? So what would happen is, if, if at this point I would try to dereference the pointer in x, I would get an error saying use of a moved value. You cannot use a moved value. So as a programmer, you can control where the unique owning pointer is, but you can't copy it. That's the essential idea. So we maintain the invariant that there's always only one pointer. So, so um, uh, here, for example, even though the, the place where one was allocated, the, the block where one was allocated has handed, and the initial variable that had the owning pointer is out of scope, I can still dereference a pointer to this uh, cell because now y holds the unique owning pointer um, and so so where does um, this get freed it will only get freed after y goes out of scope here okay so at this point even though we uh, initially had unique pointer to uh, to the one in x and x goes out of scope here because it moved the the heap cell will live longer okay the rule is when the unique pointer goes out of scope, then it gets deallocated. 
Okay, same thing happens when you call into functions. So um, uh, that's another way of copying pointers. So here you see an example. We allocate um, a one on the heap and we have a pointer to it. We could print it. We call a helper function, a very simple helper function that just prints out what the pointer is pointing to. Um, but of course, you might expect again that um, this would be a copy of this pointer. And that's what all other languages do. Rust will not do that. If you call a function in this way, you indicate as a programmer, I want to move the pointer into the function. And as a consequence, the original holder of the pointer will be marked as moved. And if, if you would try to use x after returning from the function, it would be an error. You would again get error. You try to use a moved value. So where does um, this get deallocated in this program? Where, where would, at which point in the program would um, this uh, heap cell be deallocated? Where would the compiler insert the free for you? Yes? So, so indeed here. Here is where y goes out of scope. So it would get freed here. So indeed trying to access x here would be a dangling pointer. So you see that the, the Rust compiler has to do this, has to do this check of moving. Okay, um, uh, pointers move anywhere where you usually expect a copy. In Rust, a, the, a, a boxed pointer, like we saw, will be moved. So you can move them into, stru into other boxes. You can move them into structs. So for example, this program creates a pointer to one, creates then a pointer to this pointer, and a pointer to this pointer. But the old copies of the pointers will always get moved. But so you can, I'm only showing it here for single heap cells, but you can also do it for structs. And I hope that what you can see is what, essentially what you can do is you can build up trees of um, point to two memory blobs on the heap. Yeah? And that's kind of the, the, the simplicity you get. Uh, it's, too, it's too limiting for the moment. But if you enforce this principle, what you get is that at any point in the program, you can think of the heap as a forest. It's a, it's a set of trees where the roots are in the variables um, of the, the, that the program is currently manipulating, okay? So you have every local variable can own a tree of data, and if the variable goes out of scope, then that tree can essentially be deallocated, okay? Um, so clearly that's sometimes too limiting and too annoying. So now we'll try to make things a bit more flexible again, yeah? because you sometimes want multiple pointers. So here is an example of where it's clearly too limiting or too annoying. So, so we again have here an allocation of a heap cell that contains one. We call again this helper function that prints it, and we would try to um, store a new value in x here and print it again. That doesn't work because the first call to print, to print here will have moved this pointer into this function, and when the function ends the first time, it gets deallocated. This, this is clearly not what you want in this case. So we need a way uh, for, this is one example of where it's too limiting. Here, what you want is a way to temporarily copy the pointer, uh, but you have to be sure that the pointer doesn't lift too long that it can be dangling. That's what references uh, give you. So in Rust, you have owning pointers, and these will always be unique, so that the, the picture of this tree uh, and of the forest that the heap is remains valid, but it only talks about owning pointers. You have other kinds of pointers, like references, that can be much more flexible. And so, for example, what you can do is, um, when you call a, a function like this, instead of point, uh, passing a raw, an, an owning pointer, you pass a reference, and, and, and types starting with this ampersand are reference types in Rust, um, and you can pass both references to stack allocated cells as well as to heap allocated cells. So here what I'm doing in this first example, I'll first do the stack and I'll then do the heap. I'm passing a reference to x, which essentially is this, and I will draw references as thin arrows and owning pointers as thick arrows. Okay? So we can take a reference to x, pass it in, but reference don't control the lifetime of anything. So if, if y goes out of scope, that just disappears. It, would, it doesn't mean x would get deallocated. References are just temporary borrows of access to a, to a, to a memory cell. It can be a stack cell or a heap cell. You could do the same for the heap cell. So you can take a reference to what x is pointing to, and then you would get something like this, and you can pass it into y and dereference it like we did before. And the fact that y goes out of scope doesn't do anything because it's not owning, it's only just borrowing access. Okay, does that make sense? So now, now we have a heap that's a, a forest of trees with these thick 
pointers, the owning pointers, and we can have many other pointers uh, being passed around um, under some rules. Clearly, we need some rules because otherwise we would get back the, the, the references would be like C pointers and we would, get, we would have all our problems back, right? So what are the rules? Uh, a first rule is that borrows should never outlive the owner. So you have an owning variable that owns some data structure on the heap. Then you can take a reference to that or into that. So you can, you can go down into the tree, essentially, that this variable owns. And you can take a reference to a substructure. But the compiler will check that the thing that you assign the reference to will never outlive the owner of the data structure that you take the reference from. And then you know that it's OK. The reference will die before the owner. And so when the owner dies, you can still deallocate. So that's the life. That's one of uh, the lifetime of a borrow should always be included in the lifetime of the owner from which you borrow. So here, a very simple example. Here I make uh, x point to a, a one on the heap. I make y a reference to x. I make z point to uh, a two on the heap, and I try to make y a reference to z. But now this is a problem because y is a reference, but what it's pointing to is z, and z only lives so long, and y lives until here. So I could, in principle, access y here. And, and that would be a dangling access, a dangling pointer access. So the compiler will not allow you to do this. You will always check that when you take a reference, that where you store the reference will live longer than what you reference. Okay? So you, in this case, you would get an error that z does not live long enough to take a reference to. Okay? So that's one rule. We need another one um, because, because we still have the situation. So we, we, we may have a data structure with an owner and then pointers going into it. Um, and so we have the rule that the owner should live longer than whatever is referencing the data structure. But if the, if the data structure gets mutated, things might still go wrong. Remember the example we went through in C before? We can redo that example in, in Rust. So here is an attempt to redo the example in Rust. Um, I create a vector, which is then a struct again of a length, a capacity, and a data pointer. So now the capacity starts at 1. So small difference from the C program. When I try to push on a 1, um, oh, so, sorry. So this starts, this is the state after the push has already happened. So the length has already become 1, and the, and the 1 has already been filled in. Yeah. So now I take a pointer to the first element, just like I did in C. I, I have to use a reference here, because this struct will be owning this heap cell. Um, so this will be a reference to that heap cell. Um, but now, what would happen if I would push 2? So we will not be allowed to do this. I'll explain the rule in a minute. But first, I want to show you that it would indeed be bad to allow push to. Because if we would now allow the owner to do modifications to the data structure, we would get exactly the same problem as we had before. The, the data structure still lives, and its owner is still there. But it has rearranged the heap. And as a consequence, one of the references has become dangling. So clearly, this is something we don't want. So this should be an error. And the general rule is. Um, as long as references are outstanding, you can do modifications to the data structure to the owner. And that's why, and I skipped over this, uh, um, Rust keeps track of mutability very strictly, so it knows uh, what pointers you can use to mutate a structure and what pointers you cannot use to mutate a structure. And it, that information it uses to make sure that while references are outstanding, you cannot modify um, the, the data structure to the owner. And it also enforces that you can take many references, but then you cannot mutate the data structure to them, and that's fine. Then they, nothing can ever become dangling. You can make, take as many copies or references into the data structure as you want, but nothing can change while you have them. And only when they're all gone out of scope, you might be able to change things again. Or you can take a single mutable reference. So you can take a single reference to which you can modify the data structure. Then you cannot modify it to the owner anymore. And you cannot take multiple references. So these are essentially the, the rules. So references should be stored in something that lives less long than the owner. You can take an arbitrary number of, uh, so the owner cannot, uh, you cannot change the data structure to the owner uh, while references are outstanding. And you can have as many immutable references as you want, but at most one mutable reference. These are essentially the borrowing rules. That's what the type checker checks for you. And I hope that I've given you a bit of intuition that indeed this will give you the property of temporal memory safety that we were after. OK, so to sum up, um, together these, these concepts of ownership and borrowing can give you temporal memory safety. 
and still allow relatively flexible pointer manipulating programs. Of course, you're more restricted than what you can do in C or that, than what you can do in a, in a garbage collected language. So one of the tricks of learning to work with Rust is being able to program well with pointers in these, under these constraints. And then Rust has a lot of ways to relax the constraints um, and it has other types of pointers, yes? So if I've got some big C library or code program I want to migrate to Rust, can Rust deal with calling out to the C universe where the rules are all different? Yeah, uh, so, yeah, yeah. good question. So, um, so yes uh, and no. So yes, in the sense that there is a, a foreign function interface between Rust and C. Uh, it's very convenient to use, it's very easy. Um, but it's all, you also have to mark it as unsafe. <laughs> so, so this essentially means um, you give up guarantees. Um, so you can do it, but if the C program would misbehave and, and for example, um, uh, uh, change the memory state of your Rust program so that you now have two owning pointers, then all bets are off once. And it could, it could do all kinds of messy things. So if you call into C, it could also change, if, it, if Rust is doing runtime spatial bounds check, it could change the bounds and you, all bets are off again. So yes, you can do it, but you lose safety. Um, that said, there is very interesting research going on. There's a, uh, Derek Dreyer in Saarbrücken is, is trying to formalize exactly the memory invariants that Rust enforces so that you can now um, check that the C, at least you have a spec of what C should um, maintain about memory when you call into it. And you, have, you in principle could have a way of verifying it. That said, if you have an old ugly library that you want to call into, that will probably be a too costly a, a role to take. Uh, we in Leuven are doing research on how you, could, how you can combine the protected module architectures we have with exactly this scenario. So can you run Rust, the safe part of Rust, in the enclave, and the unsafe part, the old C, outside of an enclave, outside of a protected module, and then run your program, but then the old C thing can only harm itself. It cannot mess with the memory that you manage in Rust. And can we do that in a way that we can prove that there can be no memory safety vulnerabilities in Rust is, is an ongoing research track here in Leuven. So that's complementary to what Derek Dreyer is trying to do in South So this is a very valid question, one that will come up, and, and, but that people are still working on. Okay, I think um, I should finish this part with pointing you to Rust Lang. Go, go look at the website, play a bit with the language. It's really, it's been the fastest growing language in popularity for two years in a row. Um, it, it, will, it, it, will, it will be useful to know. It, and it's very different in some respects from the languages you know. If you, if you know Java, learning C sharp, ah, so what, if you, know, if you know one scripting language, you know them all. But, but this has really some, some, some new things that, that you may not have seen before. So I'm gonna um, wrap up here. I'm gonna skip to the conclusion. So I'm gonna, um, and, and, and essentially uh, what I wanna conclude with is say that the three things I wanted to talk about, so I only talked about two of them in the end, but I'm around for lunch if you wanna hear more about the rest. They're very complementary approaches, all of them about to break through. So, so protected module architectures is, um, okay, I will focus on the, on the security of my code and review it well, and I don't want to be bothered with all the rest of the infrastructure that might be ridden with malware and vulnerabilities and whatever. How can I do that? That's protected module architectures. You protect your code from bugs in the environment. Safe languages like Rust is, how do I make sure my code doesn't have its own vulnerabilities? Huh? Um, so uh, this will help you make sure that you don't have any memory safety vulnerabilities in your own code. Maybe with less code review, with less testing, because the compiler helps you. Yeah. And then the third approach, the one I skipped, is um, about uh, what if you can change the language and you still have that problem? So if you, if you have your old bunch of C code lying around and you want the same guarantees that Rust gives you, but you can't change your code, well, people have been thinking about ways of runtime checking um, comprehensively for memory safety vulnerabilities. That's the point of base checking. I don't know if I... Um, and, and, and so I, I think we are at the point where with hardware support, this costs 20% of performance overhead and that seems like an acceptable, um, an acceptable price to pay. Um, and I, that's also why I think that that also will find its way into real life C programs in, in, in the near future. I want to uh, finish with saying that, so what I talked about today is really close to my heart in terms of the research we do here. So if this is of interest to you, if you, if, if you feel this is something you should stay informed about, um, feel free to come talk to me about potential collaborations. For example, we have, uh, we plan things like SBO projects where there can be an industrial advisory board 
uh, that follows the developments in the project, but doesn't do research itself, but just to stay informed essentially of, of, uh, of the progress of the state of the art. If that is of interest to you, any of these tracks that I, that I wanted, talked about or wanted to talk about today, feel free to grab me and, and, and we can discuss um, what kind of things we're doing here. With that, I want to finish my talk. I don't know if we have time for questions. Uh, at most, one question, does Leon say? I guess nobody dares to take. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's a good question. So the only um, uh, significant Rust program I know is the, the one Mozilla is making. Um, I, I don't know of, um, of projects using it, but, but it seems easy. I mean, uh, so I know people using Haskell on, a, on an embedded device. This is so much. So you have an LLVM compiler for it, so you can take the MSP430 backend and I don't see why it wouldn't work, but I, I, can't, I cannot point you to a specific um, project that is doing this at the moment. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I think this is one of the areas where it could... So there are two things. There's the memory safety aspect and there's the data race, the concurrency aspect that I didn't talk about. And that is maybe even more important because in big programs, people are suffering with the concurrency errors and the fact that you, you can get rid of many of these. Maybe, I, think, I think Mozilla switched to this language for their browser engine because they feared they would never be able to make the current Firefox core multi-threaded without introducing too many bugs. I think that was more important perhaps than the memory safety aspect. And maybe that's why, so in embedded device, in small embedded devices, you typically wouldn't care about the, the concurrency aspect. Okay, I guess that's the one question is taken up. So, but talk to me over lunch if you, if 